Good morning, it's Pastor Andre, and I'm excited to be on the second floor of the Hub building. As you look around me, I'm standing in a future office space that is getting ready to be framed up to the right of me is four offices that are already framed out. Soon they'll start on doing the ceiling work. So work is moving along. And uh, just this week, they started working on the parking lot, the place where we'll all get to park. And, park safely. So I'm excited this morning. And at the same time, as I'm excited, I'm also concerned. I'm concerned about where we are as a nation. I'm concerned about where we are as a city. As you keep hearing me say, murder rate climbing, un unfortunate, cruel acts of violence, taking loved ones from family members. And so this morning, while I'm excited, I also want to temper that with prayer because I want us to pray about how God is calling us as a church to enter into these moments, the good and the bad, the, the happy pieces, as well as the evil and the wickedness. We need to be prayerful about it because through prayer, we can see clearly what God is asking of each of us as, as individuals and also collectively. So I'm gonna pray this morning. I pray that you would join me. Matter of fact, um, before you join me, Type where you're viewing us this morning, whether it's you're in St. Louis, outside of St. Louis, you know, our hashtag join us from anywhere. Or better yet, you can even say I'm watching in the living room, I'm in the kitchen, you know, I'm downstairs. Type, let us know where you are this morning before we pray. And then after you tell us where you are, I want you to get with a family member if you're um, home with someone. If not, then just ask for you. To, to stand in your, in your living room or wherever you're viewing us. But if you're home with someone, take their hands. Let's, let's pray together. Let's lock hands and arms uh, technically and pray because I believe there's power in prayer. So let's do it. Here we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We honor you today. God, there's no one like you. And so we celebrate that. And also, Lord, we lament some of the things we see happening in our world today. God, we see things that alarm us, concern us, and in some ways may even frighten us. And yet we know you are sovereign. So today we, we come, Lord, trusting you, laying down our burdens upon you. Some of us are battling with decisions. Some of us are just struggling with life right now. It's hard, it's difficult, Lord. Some of us are still wondering is there an end in sight to COVID-19 and this pandemic? God, I believe that when we trust you, whether we get the answer we want or not, we can find peace. So I pray for that peace that surpasses all understanding this morning, that peace that can saturate our hearts and minds when we stay focused on you, that it will enter every living room and every tablet and every phone 
from wherever someone is viewing this this morning. I also pray, God, that you would just move on our city, that violence will begin to cease and that God more camaraderie would come and that we would be able to come together as one, Lord, in ways you've called us to. Then God, help us to see no matter who wins an election, that God, you are sovereign and that you are in control and that there's no issues in heaven despite what we see on earth. Today, Lord, we come getting ready to celebrate, ready to magnify, ready to lift you up. Why? Not because life is so good, but because you are good. And we thank you for your goodness today and your grace and how you've applied mercy and allowed us a brand new day. It's in Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. All right, let's get ready to worship. Be ready to sing along with our worship team as they come.
you enjoy worship this morning. And as we continue in worship, squad, you are free to be into Zoom for your class to continue um, talking about redeeming the screen. By the way, squad, those of you who were able to come out for um, the fellowship, it was great seeing you all using your artistic skills. Uh, thank you to Sister Kenya and First Lady, my wife and Brother Terry, for organizing and pulling this all together for our teens and preteens. Again, squad, the ID is coming across the screen. The flyer has been up. It's your time now. Matter of fact, why don't you invite a friend this morning? You know, hop on Snapchat or whatever mechanism of communication you want to use and say, hey, join me 
Uh, give them the Zoom ID. Say, join me in squad this morning. We're talking about some powerful things with God as the center and Jesus as our Lord. So squad, do your thing. You're free. You're free from your parents. Go in your room or wherever you do and how you do and uh, enter in. This morning for us grownups, if you will, or those who are young at heart, seasoned, etc., we're going to start a new series this morning. It's a new teaching in 1 Peter chapter 3. So if you want to go ahead and get your phone or your tablet there or your Bible, if you still use a physical Bible like me, 1 Peter chapter 3 is where we'll be for the next three Sundays. And this new series is called Living as One. What does it look like for us to live in unity in such disunified times? Meaning you, you can take politics, you can take this pandemic, you can take the economy, you can take local job issues, school, you name it. There's so much division right now. And so how do we live together? Who is God calling us to be as his children and helping be bridge builders instead of bridge um, destroyers? And so we're going to look at 1 Peter 3 because it helps us deal with unity. And here's the deal. Unity is built stronger in the midst of suffering. So I just happen to believe that God has, in his infinite wisdom, used this time to teach us long suffering and how when we suffer together and struggle together, that there can be some commonality together. It doesn't mean, unity doesn't mean we agree on everything. It's, it does mean that we have a foundation that we're willing to celebrate our uniqueness in unity. So we began some of this in our Bible study one past Tuesday, shameless plug, get on this Tuesday. The, the link for Zoom goes out every Tuesday, join us. We take a deeper dive in this subject of oneness, but we're starting today, living as one. First Peter chapter three is where we'll be. And I'm going to read this to you from the NLT. We're going to look at the first seven verses. Now, let me give this disclaimer this morning. This first seven verses does deal with husbands and wives, but we're going to unpack it in such a way that we see how it's applicable to all of our lives, whether you are married or single. So before you look at it and go, oh, pastor, I gave up on love a long time ago. Love don't live here no more. But let me tell you, there's still something to learn from marriage because it is the picture that God chose to show the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church, which ultimately relationship between him and his people. So that's what we'll glean this morning. First Peter Chapter three, when you have it, type a man in the comments this morning, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, just type a man. Let me know you got it. First Peter chapter three. We're going to read these first seven verses I'm reading today from the NLT. And here's what it says. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Today's focus, oneness in relationships, oneness in relationships. So here's how we're going to start this off. We started off with interaction. We're going to interact today, so keep your keyboard or however you type in comments or leave messages on social platforms. So I'm gonna give you two minutes this morning. And if you notice the, the, the topic here 
um, or the scriptures start off with dealing with this issue of submission, that nasty S word that many of us cringe when we hear it. So I'm going to read to you again these first couple of verses, but read them from the message Bible. Just listen at this. The same goes for you wives. Be good wives to your husband, responsive to their needs. There are husbands who, indifferent as they are to any words about God, will be captivated by your life of holy beauty. This whole idea of the S word. So you got two minutes. Tell me what comes to mind when you hear the word submission. Ready? Go. Oh, I can't wait this morning to see your comments because I know some of us really just kind of either shut down or we start to feel some kind of way when you say the S word, submission. What comes to mind? Or better yet, how do you respond when someone even begins to talk to you about submission? <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. Let me see it. You can be honest this morning. What comes to mind? I especially, I, I want to hear from everybody, but I definitely want to hear from the married people. What comes to mind? Come on, talk to me, husbands and wives this morning. You're viewing from all over the city. Some of you viewing from other states. What comes to mind with the S word? Submission. <laughs> yeah, you got about 60 seconds left. Come on, let's be real. Let's be honest this morning. Submission. What does it do for you or what does it stir up in you? <laughs> yeah, now you're, you're clicking with the comments. That's what I'm talking about. We, we're going to get into this. And the, by the way, the whole teaching this morning is not just about submission, but it is part of the context. Because in order for us to be one, we have to deal with this topic submission, biblical submission. For some of us, I know it's been distorted. Come on, you got about 15 more seconds. What comes to mind? What flows out of you? What language comes into your, your psyche when you hear the word submission? Five more seconds left. Come on, you got this. You can share. You can still share. All right. So based off some of these responses, I want to give you some context. Peter, the disciple, the apostle now who writes to us this letter is one who had to learn what submission was. He struggled. He had his issues. He had temper problems, anger management challenges, and he had to learn what it really meant to be submissive to Christ because we can't be submissive to one another, to all of us are submissive to Jesus. That's why in Ephesians chapter five, most people wanna jump right to verses 22 through 33 and talking about husbands and wives and husbands wanna use it to try and broad beat their wives into submission and wives are using it to say, listen, you're supposed to love me like you love the church. However, sometimes we miss the first part of that, which is verse 21, which makes up this ideal and ancient Near Eastern culture of talking about relationships and how we are to interact with them. It says, be submissive one another to you as you are to Christ. So to understand here, Peter is now carrying that forward, that same ideal. The context of this actually starts, if you have time this week, look at 1 Peter starting in chapter 2, actually in verse 11. It builds up to this point in chapter 3. Because in chapter two, starting at verse 11, is where we walk into the concept of submission in relationships as a whole. And it walks through being submissive to those who are in authority. And it's particularly focused in on government. And then it talks about relationships between masters and slaves. Please understand when you hear that before you allow your skin to crawl, that slavery and the Bible and how it is taught and spoken of is not slavery which was so evil and demonic by which many of our ancestors experienced if you are an African-American in this country. It's not the same. It's more of a working relationship. So this ideal was introduced. And the way it was introduced, Peter tells in chapter 2, verse 11, do not succumb to your flesh. 
and allow your flesh to rule you. And then verse 12, he says in chapter two, just because you have freedom, don't use that freedom to sin, but rather to serve. So submission deals with servanthood and servitude. It is the ideal of I'm going to submit my rights that I may be one who is righteous by serving just as my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did while he was on earth and serves us now at the right hand of God. And so as we walk into chapter three, it continues this idea of submission through various relationships and we get to husband and wife. Again, as I mentioned before, God chose marriage to be the picture of the mystery between Christ and his church. That's what God chose. I didn't choose it. God chose it. If you have an issue, take that up with God. However, this morning, I am here to teach and to bring this forward because there are a few things that I want all of us to see and as how it relates to we are called to live as one. Some pragmatic, practical principles that I think we can take forward in our everyday life and discover that God's plan and purpose is for us to live as persons who are in one with one another, togetherness. And so the first thing I want you to see in this passage this morning is the godly example. Look back at verses one and two. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Some translations there say, be submissive. That means to be subject in order of. Please understand cultural context that Peter is writing to mainly a Gentile population. In other words, a non-Jewish audience, although there are some Jews that are a part of this audience he's writing to because these folks are in exile or in chapter one, as he calls it in the verse three and four, it's dispersia. It's those whom have been estranged or estranged from their homeland. They are being persecuted. They are suffering because they are Christian, because they are followers of Christ. And so when he writes this, it's believed by many that he's writing to folks who are experiencing this persecution in Rome. And in Roman culture, typically the wife took on the religion of the husband. Whatever the husband's religion was, that's the wife's religion. And Peter recognizes that some wives did not do that they stood for Jesus. They were Jesus followers, perhaps, before they married their husbands. And so, therefore, he's writing to show them how to be a godly example. Part of becoming one is to be an example of God for all of us who are believers. Please take that into your psyche this morning. We are called to be one by exemplifying God by living out who Jesus called us to be. And in this relationship of husband and wife, if the Peter's writing to say to wives, if your husband, watch this, is not a follower of Christ, if he's not a believer in God, Yahweh, the one and true living God, then my goal in writing this to you is to encourage you and to exhort you by saying, here's your calling. Not to be argumentative, but allow your activity and your actions to show your allegiance to Jesus. I'm going to say that again, not to be argumentative. Here's your calling. Catch this. If you're watching this at home and you are dating someone or you are married to someone who is not a believer, your goal is not to then go home and argue with them and beat them up with the Bible. In order for us to live as one, Peter, led by the Holy Spirit, teaches us this morning that the goal is to be a godly example. And the way to do that is not to argue, not to fuss, not to fight, but to allow our activity and our actions show our allegiance to our Christ, the one who we call the great our advocate, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is the beginning and the end. That is how we do this. So I know for this morning, some of you, I just mess with you because you all about the words. You all about the conversation. I'm not saying this is saying be silent in the sense of never talk. What I am saying is it's calling us to be evangelistic by our actions and not by our words. Some translations say where this says to speak without any words, to say to win them who are against words, meaning the gospel, meaning the good news, God's message of salvation, to win them without words. So God 
and his infinite wisdom calls us to this, right? So if God calls us to be godly examples by our actions, there's something else to it. Verse two talks about being observed to be reverent and pure. If you're reading from the message Bible, as I read earlier, it says that you your beauty will be captivating. This shows how God says wise ladies can be an example to a non-believer by simply how they live and how they carry themselves, not by what they say and not about how they express themselves verbally, but how they live how they live virtuously. You talk about Proverbs 31, a virtuous woman. It's talking about actions. It's the actions, not the attitude. It's the actions. Yes, attitude often determines altitude. Here though, attitude determines action. And if we are called to live as one, ladies, wives, girlfriends, friends, you are called to conduct yourself in such a way that your actions are captivating, <laughs> your actions. Godly example, that's the wise. But now let me get to the husbands because I know some of you are at home on the sofa and while your husband or boyfriend or significant other is sitting there nudging you saying, are you listening to the pastor this morning and you sitting there sweating and boiling and wanting to say something else that I dare not say on camera in God's sanctuary, I'm gonna help you to be able to nudge your husband back. Verse seven, check this deals with the man's godly example in the same way. That word in the same way, some translations start likewise at verse seven, same way with verse one. It's linking us back to this ideal of submission. It says, verses seven, in the same way, catch this, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Honor, that means to esteem. It means to lift up. It means to celebrate. It means to congratulate. It means to cheerlead. It means to put on center in your heart and in your life. You are to honor, 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 honor. It goes deeper than date night, but that's a part of it. Honor. It, it goes, it, it, it's, it's more than just saying that I love you. It's showing, it's expression. It's honor, honor your wives. It says, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Understanding means, watch this, to be submissive in terms of wanting to know what she needs to serve her well. You cannot know what she needs to serve her well if you never talk to her and or listen to what she has to say. Yes, now wise, I see you nudging, nudging back, yeah. I see you nudging a significant other back. Did you catch what pastor said? I think by the end of this, both of y'all gonna be mad at me. Good thing uh, this is virtual, so I don't even have to run. I can just walk outside and get in my car and you can't catch me. No, but seriously, this is what it speaks of when it talks about godly example. It, it gives us the way for the men. It gives us the way for the ladies. We are to then be servants, men. And in order to serve, we have to submit to the ones we're serving to know how to serve them well. This is the godly example. Some of you may have heard me say this before. The, the greatest story I've ever been told and has got a chance to glimpse was from one of my professors in seminary. His mom marries and everybody in the family doesn't want mom to marry this guy. He was that guy. You know, you, you know, some of us, if we're honest this morning, you can be honest, by the way, because the teens and preteens are supposed to be in squad. So you can be honest. All of us at one point or another have dated that person. You know what that person is? That that one where everybody in your family and in your personal circle of friends always tries to warn you about. Or when they come around, everybody becomes standoffish and silent. That person. Yeah, we've all had at least one of those, some of us more than one. And by the grace of God, we made it out, praise him. That one. Well, she was marrying that one and the family was against it. My professor was against it. After the wedding, wedding evening, not even wedding, wedding night, this gentleman does something. And he says to his mom, listen, you can nullify this marriage. You can get out of this. Mom says, no, this is my calling. 
Now, please hear me. I'm not saying this is every woman's calling or every man's calling. I'm trying to highlight the idea of being godly examples. They stay married for almost 31, 32 years. And in this marriage, it has some moments of real tumultuous times, challenging times. The husband, mean, rude, and cruel at times. Family saying to her, you need to walk away. She says, no, this is my call. As he gets to a point later in life where he's not doing well, his heart begins to soften a little bit. And in his latter days, he comes to the place in his life where he recognizes he's totally deprived, meaning no goodness dwells in him and he needs Jesus. He prays, he confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior. Him and my professor, while they didn't have this close relationship, they began to at least have some type of relationship. And my professor said, it. he asked him, after all these years, why now? What led you? And his stepdad said, it was not what words your mom used. It was the way she lived and how she treated me. And because of how she treated me, I knew God had to be real. Unfortunately, it took me several decades to know that God was real. However, it was your mom's faithfulness and consistency that allowed me to see that God is real, that Jesus is Lord because of how she treated me. Friends, all I'm trying to highlight is that we can be in some of the most hostile times, which this is a hostile moment in our culture and society. We can be in a time where life is hard and difficult which I believe we are. And with all of that, we can still be godly ex examples, live as one, be submissive one to another and serve each other well. And by doing so, it's so evangelistic and so powerful that it will leave the, the most denied person in your mind, meaning you believe there's no way that God could save them God can move on their hearts by the witness of how we live. Godly example. But Peter doesn't stop there about a godly example. He shows us also godly equality. Equality. But before I deal with equality, I want to deal with equity. Because Peter shows us that as well. Equity gets into the concept of each person being valued. We are all made in the image of God and we are living in a time where many are attacking the very image of God because they attack image bearers and treat them poorly, including sometimes, unfortunately, taking their lives on live video. And yet God calls us in these times of difficulty, pain, and hurt to remember there's equity in every person. Look back at the text, starting at verse three. It says this, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. Verse four, you should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious, to God. Oh, there's so much to unpack there, ladies. I want to start there about your equity. Look at understanding equity deals with value. Your value is not wrapped up in what's in your closet. Your value is not wrapped up in what's in your bank account. Your value is not wrapped up in your savings or wrapped up in your retirement plan. Your value is not wrapped up in your position in corporate America or if you run your own business. Your value, your equity, your worth is in the inside. Now, please hear me. Peter is not saying here that calling women to not dress up, look nice. No, that's not what he's saying. Please keep in mind that God made men to be visual creatures. So please, if you start walking around looking real crazy, we're going to be in tune and we're going to ask you what's going on with you. So don't, don't take this out of context to say that that means I don't need to ever look presentable at all. That's not what Peter is saying. What he is saying is don't place more value, more time, more effort, more 
investment on your external without being willing to do the internal work because what is on the inside will eventually make its way on the outside and you can be a dressed up mess or a person with a bad attitude that's dressed to the nines. He's saying deal with what's on the inside. Here's the part, ladies, that I love. He says a gentle and quiet spirit. Gen gen gentle. You know what gentle means? It means, gen it means gentle. G g gentle and quiet. Some of y'all looking through the TV real hard once again. Here he go again, because ain't nothing gentle or quiet about me. That might be true. However, when you come to Jesus and his spirit, the Holy Spirit begins to live on the inside of you. Over time, he begins to transform you and who you once were, you can't be going forward in the future if you are his. Therefore, there should be some transformation. You might have been one who was on 10. You should have been walking with Jesus a while. You should be down to at least a nine or eight. Over time, decreasing, gentle, quiet spirit. <laughs> Look at that. It says unfading beauty. That spirit is talking about the fruit of the spirit. More of that should be becoming evident. That's your equity, love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things that Peter is speaking of. That's your equity. That's where you find equity. Here's the part that I love, he says in verse five, this is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. <laughs> Check this out. This is how they made themselves beautiful, by how they put their trust in God. Faith, equity comes first from faith in God. And accepting, here it says authority, other translations say submission of their husbands. I'm gonna read it. In the Message Bible, I, I want you to hear this. Starting at verse three, what matters is not your outer appearance, the styling of your hair, the jewelry you wear, the cut of your clothes, but your inner disposition. Cultivate inner beauty. I love that word, cultivate. The gentle, gracious kind that God delights in. The holy women of old were beautiful before God that way and were good, loyal wives to their husbands. Did you catch that, ladies, this morning? This is where your equity is. And here's the next part, verse six, where I'm really going to blow you out the water. And I pray you still love me afterwards. I'm talking about your equity. For, for instance, here's the example. No need for me to even give an illustration because it's illustrated in the text. Verse six, for instance, Sarah obeyed her husband. I know some of y'all like, oh, man, if the S word wasn't enough, here you talking about obey obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. Oh, 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 man, I don't expect offering to be good today. He said master, she, master. Some translations say Lord with a lowercase L because there's only one Lord, capital L, God, Jesus Christ. But it says called him her master and you are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. It's speaking to the fact, again, that in Roman culture, as I mentioned earlier, the wife would typically take on the religion of the husband. But since you're living as a Christian woman, there could be some concerns about blowback, about staying a Christian, even though your husband was not. But it says when you serve your husband well or submissive to him to the point that it does not take you outside or cause you to compromise your faith in Jesus Christ, then all bets are off. Catch that, ladies. Know your value. Know your equity. Anything that takes you away from Jesus Christ, no. But anything that does not compromise, that serve well, treat him as dear. The Message Bible says it this way in verse 6. It says, Sarah, for instance, taking care of Abraham will address him as my dear husband. And it wasn't predicated on if he did what she liked or didn't like that day. It wasn't predicated on if he always took her advice or not. Although if he values her, he should be listening to her. It's simply just because she's called to it. That's where her equity comes from. That's what makes her beautiful. You want to be a beautiful wife? Serve your husband well. 
<laughs> yeah, if you ain't willing and ready to serve serve whoever you with well, then I suggest you either don't get married or you might want to end that relationship. But the reality of it is what makes a wife beautiful is not so much what happens on the outside, but what God is staring up and doing on the inside. Equity, equity, equity. Now, brothers, go back to verse seven for us. Equity. Same goes for you husbands. Be good husbands to your wives. B, that B is present, meaning <laughs> it don't mean be good one day, brother, or one hour. It's called to it, lifetime. Honor them, delight in them. As women, in the Message Bible says, they lack some of your advantages. I like that. In the NLT, right there, it says, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are. Please catch what the text is saying. It's not talking about being inferior or intellectually incapable as a woman. It's talking physically about strength, physical strength. Yes, in many cases, we as men are physically stronger than our wives, moms, aunts, cousins, the women in our lives. And I would still argue there's a part where they are much stronger than us physically, because I promise you, if it was left up to men to populate the world, there probably would not be any children. I love when I meet couples and they say, the man especially, we having a baby, a baby, excuse me. I say, nah, brother, uh, she having a baby. You just get to hold our hand and pray that you don't mess that up. Because when you look at it, what it takes for a life to get here, I would say women are quite strong. However, the equity men is in us cherishing the fact of the physical strength not being the same. Our equity comes through in how we honor that and serve that and understand that and protect and do not put our wives, women, and those we love in compromising positions. What has gotten us out of sync and out of order in our communities as men, we left our post in terms of protecting and providing for our communities and therefore left our women exposed. But God says, here, check this, honor them understanding lack of some advantages. I like that in the message Bible because you take corporate America, women are still, especially black women are still not paid nowhere near their counterparts and certainly nowhere near a man. You, you take the level and amount of work that they do and they still pay wise come up short, benefits wise come up short, title and position come up short. They hit ceilings that many of us, even as men of color don't even know about and God is speaking to it here to say, brother, your equity comes through, your value comes through and how you honor and support her as she wrestles with not having the advantages that you have. Our equity is in what we're willing to bless with. Her equity is in what she does from the inside out. She can, she can bless the marriage or she can break the marriage by what's on the inside. We can bless the marriage by how we honor and walk alongside and provide for opportunities and make ways and, and despite the disadvantage that she faces, or we can break it by pretending as if she's not the weaker vessel in terms of strength and break her down. This, friends, is godly equity. And if we're going to be one, if we're going to live as one, we have to live as godly examples, understanding godly equity. And here's my last thing, and I'm out of your way. Godly equality. Equality equals equals. Hear me, brothers, today. Women are our equals, not our sidekicks. Hear me today. Women are to be cherished by us, not forgotten by us. Equality equal. We are equal. It calls it out in verse seven, the B clause, catch this. It says, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. In the message Bible it says, but in the new life of God's grace, your 
equals. Treat your wives then as equals. This is God saying that, that while there may be different roles and functions between man and woman, we are equal in terms of salvation. When Christ died, Ephesians 2 and 19 tells us that he tore the curtain in the temple and ripped it so that all could come together, Jew and Greek. <laughs> could come together, Jew and Gentile. There are Gen Galatians 3 and 28. There is no more slave or free, male or female, but we are one in Christ. Is God doing away with gender? No. What is talking about us being one and saved and salvation is for all. And there is an equal amount of salvation because we're all equal. Equality. Catch this. Now, let me talk about how equality plays out for a moment, ask you one more question, and then I'm out of your way so you can enjoy this Sunday. Catch this. Verses one and two show us how women are equal because their evangelism skills are so strong that they don't even have to say a word. It's just in how they live and they can reach a man's heart. Sister, do you know that you can change the landscape of wherever you are just by how you conduct yourself? You, you can shift the atmosphere just because of how you conduct yourself. You want to see a great revival? Let women start living out equally who they are in God and watch God do some things. I know some men this morning that's going to mess with your head because you think everything has to happen and start with you. But God has proven here that God didn't say, and watch this, the woman being the one who was not saved. It deals with the man. So please understand that there is power in her equality to be able to evangelize and reach the loss just by how she lives. She don't even have to say a word. I believe if women understood how more speech, more speech is spoken by their conduct versus out of their mouths, they would talk less and live more. Catch that, if you will, this morning. So please see that. Here's the other thing I want you to see. Verse five, equality. Her equality shows in how she serves her husband. Again, be considered one of Sarah's, the text says, is by calling my dear husband or my Lord, my master. Don't get hung up on the word. Get hung up on the mission. The mission is servanthood and servitude. You want to be a servant leader? Serve in your home well by serving your spouse. It shows your equality. But here, man, I'm back to us because in verse seven, it also says, Treat her as you should. Watch this so your prayers would not be hindered. There's something powerful to that. There's equality in prayer. And please understand when we don't treat that relationship right, that it hinders our prayers. Hinder their meaning. God does not hear us when we pray. Want to question why something is off? Are you treating her as your equal or treating her as the one beneath or below you? Are you treating her as one as honor and cherish, or are you treating her as if she's just something to do until something else comes along that's better? Because if that's your treatment of her, equality then is not being practiced. That's unequal. And God says, until you get equality right, brother, I won't even hear you. Catch that this morning. God says, I will not hear you. I won't listen to you until this is equal. Jesus talked about it in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter five of Matthew, verses 23 and 24, when he says, if you are at the altar about to be able to getting ready to present your gift and you remember that someone has an issue with you, you go and resolve that first and then come back and give your gift. God then here through the Holy Spirit leading Peter to write says to us as men, if you're not treating that relationship as equal as there is an equal submission, then please understand, I won't hear you. Hmm. I don't read nowhere else where God says to a woman, I won't hear you. But he said it to us, brothers, equality, godly equality. I leave you with this question today because I know I just threw a lot on you. But I leave you with this question today. 
And we're going to give you two minutes because I want you to take this practically as we start talking about living as one. How can you and I, I include myself, I'm not exempt. How can you and I be better godly examples and share equality one to another? I'm going to say it again. How can you and I be better godly examples in our world? starting in our homes and then in our workplaces and beyond and better show equality. You got two minutes to come up with something. Let's go. Let's get it. Come on in the comments because I want this to be practical. And as you're getting ready to type, share this with you. I love this book by Tony Dungy and his wife called The Uncommon Marriage. It's a devotional. It gives practical examples of how they show equality and godly examples in living, not only as husband and wife, but just in life. If this is an area of struggle for you and or an area you want to grow in or an area you just want ideas and deeper thought on, get the book. You order everything else on Amazon. You can order this on Amazon and have it shipped to your front door. The Uncommon Marriage by Tony Dungy and his wife. Come on with the comments. How can you and I be better godly examples and show equality one to another as we live as one? Come on, I want to see what you come up with. You got about 60 more seconds. Let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. How can we do it better? We in this together. Better examples highlight equality. Come on, come on. You got about 30 more seconds left. There we go. Now a couple of comments. Come on. How can you and I be better godly examples and show equality one to another? Got to be something we can do or some things that we can do. You got about 15 more seconds. Come on. You type, share, everything else. Come on, let's share. Let's talk. Let's be there for each other. About five more seconds left. How can we show equality and be godly examples better? All right. Love those comments. We're going to write them down. We're going to use some of those and talk about some of this shameless plug again about Bible study. Now, here we go. Here's how we're going to close. We're going to close in prayer. Why? Because I understand this takes prayer. We have to be led by God. His spirit has to lead us to live like this, especially in times like today. But I just believe if we begin to live as one in our relationships, we can see a shift in our society. We can see a change over time. It's not something we do one time. It's something we got to do over time to become all God would have us to be. If you still got that person in the house, y'all ain't ran each other off. You ain't mad at each other. I'm sure it's going to create some healthy dialogue that's good. Love to hear about it. Send us an email. Drop us a line if you have some discussion about this with your spouse, significant other, or friend, uh, confidant even, co-worker about living as one and what you learned today. But I want to pray. Let's pray. Get your family member's hand. Here we go. Let's do it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this day. Another day not promised, but you gave us a gift. Lord, help us to live as one. May we allow your spirit living inside of us to guide us as we do this. God, we recognize this is countercultural. We're supposed to be fighting and continuing to take sides. And God, while debate is good and understanding and giving room for different perspectives is good, we still need to come back together as one. Help us to live that out practically. Help us to live in areas where we disagree and still move forward representing you, our King. God, help us to be more submissive to one another instead of fighting for ourself. Let us be more sacrificial. And Lord, may we know that when we do, we can trust that you've got our backs and that you're protecting us and that you're going to cover us and resource us so that we may live that way well. Today, Lord, may you be glorified. And in this week, Lord, may you be magnified in all that we do as we seek to live as one. It's in Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. God bless you. If you've got a moment today, join us. 
briefly in the Tab Cafe in the Zoom. We love to see you. We're starting to see new faces show up. It's so good to see you in that way. And shameless plug again, Tuesday, Bible study, 630 Zoom. You'll get the link. Join us for Bible study. Until we get to come together again, take care and God bless.